I'm Akaya Smith. I'm a lung doctor, pulmonologist down at HUP, and I came up here to talk to you guys today about shortness of breath, what we like to call dyspnea, just to keep it complicated, um, and specifically about pulmonary hypertension, a pretty uncommon cause of shortness of breath, but an important one for us to think about, all right? So dyspnea, as I said, it's just a fancy way of saying shortness of breath. It's a sensation of just not being able to get enough air in. You can't take a deep breath in, you have trouble breathing out, you can't breathe well enough to do the things that you need to do in your life. That's what shortness of breath is. It's, it's pretty subjective, um, and a lot of things can cause shortness of breath. It's the most common complaint that brings patients into the, um, into the doctor's office, especially patients with heart disease or lung disease. Shortness of breath is the most common complaint. It's also one of the most common complaints in patients who have no heart disease and no lung disease, which makes it pretty hard to sort out what's going on. For example, let's start with a case. It's a 48-year-old woman. Her initials are CG. She's a lifelong non-smoker, and she's pretty active. She used to run one or two miles pretty regularly. Now she's very short of breath. She complains of dyspnea, okay? Now she can barely get up a flight of stairs, and this is a woman who used to run quite recently. She has a past medical history, only of rheumatic heart disease as a child, but otherwise it's pretty healthy. She's on no medications, and she has no allergies. She has a family history of coronary artery disease. Her mother had a heart attack when she was rather young. But other than that, she's a pretty unremarkable history. So we have a 48-year-old woman with really no problems who's now short of breath. What do you do, okay? So to understand all the things that can cause you to be short of breath, you gotta go back to school with me, and we're gonna take Circulation 101, all right? So here it is, looks pretty complicated, but I'm gonna make it really simple. The heart sits in the middle of the chest, and it's got two sides, a left side in red here, and a blue side, the right side, okay? So let's see if the mouse will work with me. Forgive me, this is not my computer. So here's the red side is the left side of the heart. Every time the heart pumps, blood that has lots of oxygen goes from the left side out to the body to feed the body. Oxygen and sugar are two of the main foods of the body, and to do its work, the brain, the kidney, the lungs, the muscles, the entire body needs oxygen and, and sugar, okay? So every time the heart pumps, the left side of the heart sends blood out to the body that has lots of oxygen, and the body takes what it needs. Now that blood has less oxygen after it goes through the body, and it needs to be reloaded. All that blood comes back to the other side of the heart, okay, the blue side, the right side of the heart. So all the blood goes from the left side to feed the body, and it comes back to the right side of the heart because it needs to be reloaded. The heart beats, and the right side of the heart pumps that blood up through the lungs, where ideally, you're breathing, okay? You're taking some nice deep breaths, and you reload that blood with oxygen. It goes back to the left side, back out to the body to feed the body again, then comes right back to the right side to go through the lungs, get reloaded, and do the whole circle again. Did everyone follow that? So that's the basics of the circulation. Pretty simple, right? If you look at this diagram, though, there are lots of things here that can go wrong. And any part of this circulation can lead to shortness of breath if it goes wrong. What that means is that lung diseases, any disease that makes it hard for the lungs to do its job, take a deep breath in, take a deep breath, breathe all the way out, get oxygen in, anything that causes the lung to be unable to do its job can make you short of breath. What about the heart? Well, the heart's a really important part of the circulation we just went through. Anything that makes the heart unable to do its job can make you feel short of breath, okay? And that includes heart attacks, okay? But it also means high blood pressure or problems with the valves. We're gonna go through those some more. But any problems with the heart can make you feel short of breath. The blood vessels are a key part of this. They carry the blood out from the heart to feed the body and right back to the right heart and through the lungs. They're the railroad. They're absolutely essential. Problems with the blood vessels can also make you feel short of breath. Finally, the body is responsible for how you feel overall. The heart delivers oxygen through the blood to the body, 
and the body has to do work. If the body itself, the muscles, don't work well, you feel short of breath. Okay, so all parts of this system, this circulation, are important for you to feel well and not feel short of breath. And all of them, if something is wrong, can lead to a sense of not being able to breathe well enough. So we're going to zoom in on the heart and go quickly because we just went through a lot of these things. So anything that makes the heart muscle unable to squeeze well, if you've had a heart attack and the heart muscle doesn't work very well, that can make you short of breath because the heart muscle doesn't work very well. Sometimes the heart muscle just gets sick for other reasons, even if you haven't had a heart attack and doesn't squeeze well. That's what we call cardiomyopathy, a disease of the heart muscle. It's pretty straightforward and there are a lot of things that can cause it. But anything that makes the heart unable to do its pumping job well is going to make you short of breath. Okay? Anything that disturbs the flow. Remember we talked about that very organized system. Left heart body, right heart lung. Left heart body, right heart lung. Anything that makes that system unable to go in that, that direction in a very efficient way can make you short of breath. Things that do that are troubles like valve disease. The valves in the heart make sure the blood go in the right direction, make sure it doesn't go backwards. If the valves leak, sometimes the blood goes backwards instead of forwards, and that can make you short of breath. If the heart doesn't squeeze well or your blood pressure is too high and the heart can't do its work well, some of the blood will go forwards, but some of it will go backwards, and that will make you short of breath. That's what we call heart failure, when the, some of the blood goes backwards into the lung. Okay? So anything that makes the heart not squeeze well or disturbs the circulation, the direction of blood flow, can make you short of breath. Finally, uh, the heart has to have a nice, normal rhythm. Beat, 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 beat. You can feel it in your pulse right now. And that's the heart actively pumping blood through the body. If the heart has an irregular rhythm or doesn't beat properly, that can make you short of breath. Finally, the heart is wrapped in a, in a sac. We call it the pericardium, but it's like saran wrap around the heart. And if that wrapping is too tight or has any problems of its own, it's sick. It makes the heart unable to do its job right, disturbs the circulation, and can make you short of breath. What do you need to take away from this slide? There are a lot of heart diseases that can make you short of breath. And when some, you see your doctor and tell him you're short of breath, the symptoms are going to help him, but also you're going to need a, a more thorough evaluation to figure out, is it the heart? What's wrong with the heart? And if it's not the heart, could it be the lungs? Remember, that system depends on the heart, the lungs, the vessels, and the body. Okay, So it could be the heart. If it's not the heart, it could be the lungs. So let's think about the breathing system. This is my organ. This is the one I love. So. Think about the breathing as starting at your nose and going all the way to your mid-abdomen where your diaphragm lives, the muscle of breathing. And I'm going to show it to you on the picture. So it starts here at the nose and we breathe air in through the nose or the mouth and it goes down the breathing tube. And if you feel here, you'll feel ridges in the front. That's your breathing tube. That's your trachea. It's like a hollowed out tree trunk. The lungs are very much like a tree turned upside down. Okay? So the air comes in your nose and mouth goes down that hollowed out tree trunk and down the branches, the hollowed out branches, okay? So you breathe oxygen in and the leaves are, the lungs are like leaves around that upside down tree. So you breathe the oxygen in and it's absorbed in the leaves. At the same time, carbon dioxide comes out and comes out your mouth back out the hollowed out tree. Does that make sense? So you breathe it in, it goes down the branches and it's absorbed in the lungs and the lungs produce the CO2, and you breathe it out. That's pretty much what the lungs do. Out there in the leaves, in the lungs, that's where the blood vessels live, and they're absorbing all that oxygen you're breathing in. Okay? So just like the heart system, anything in there could go wrong. So anything that blocks the breathing tubes, make it, makes it hard for the air to get in or the air to get out, can make you short of breath. Okay? Cause dyspnea. So we think about upper airways. Okay, and those are the big tubes starting here. Anything that blocks there can cause shortness of breath. I'm going to come back. Okay, other things that cause blockage in the smaller tubes, the smaller branches, we call them bronchioles, things like COPD, okay, smoking-related lung disease, uh, 
chronic obstructive lung disease, or asthma. They cause blockages way out in the small branches. They cause shortness of breath that way. They make it hard to breathe in by hurting the lung. Okay? We describe the lungs themselves like leaves around those branches. Anything that messes with the leaves, messes with the lungs themselves, can make it hard for you to breathe. If you have a pneumonia, it fills those leaves up with pus, literally. The infection fills it up, and it's hard for air to get in. It makes you short of breath. Sometimes the lungs scar, makes it hard for the lungs to stretch and do their job. You can get short of breath. Lots and lots of things in the lungs can go wrong. Much like the heart, the lung is wrapped in saran wrap. We call it the pleura this time. It's not so much important to remember the name, except that if that scars or gets sick, it can also make you short of breath. Take home from this slide, there are a million things in the lung that can also make you short of breath. The heart's important, the lungs are important. Finally, we always have to think about cancer when we think about the lung and shortness of breath. Cancer can affect both the lungs out where the leaves part way out at the end, or it can affect the breathing tubes where air gets in and out. It's an important um, cause of shortness of breath when we think about lung causes of shortness of breath. Okay? And then there's the stuff that's not the heart, and it's not the lungs, it's everything else. It takes muscles to breathe. You don't think about it because you were born doing it and it's easy to do. But there's a very important muscle called the diaphragm. And every time you take a breath in, it's working. You don't even feel it, but it's working. If you, your muscles are weak from diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, lots of diseases that can make the muscles weak, it can be hard to take that breath because the diaphragm is weak and you feel short of breath. The other thing that can make you be, feel short of breath is two things, being out of shape, okay? So how does being out of shape make you short of breath? Well, we talked about the muscles all needing oxygen and sugar to do their work, okay? If the muscles are trained, are efficient, they need less oxygen and sugar to do the same amount of work, okay? If they're not trained, then they need extra, which means the heart has to work extra hard because the muscles are out of shape. Okay, that's what we call deconditioning. But it essentially says the body is inefficient, and when it's inefficient, the heart has to work harder to get it going. Does that make sense? The other thing that we think about with deconditioning is your weight. So this is something we don't think about often because our body is just our body. It's what we live with every day. But if I handed anyone in here two 100-pound weight, said, so carry these 200 pounds up those stairs four times. You'd say, no, thank you, ma'am. That's going to make me short of breath, right? We can all understand that. However, if you're carrying 100 extra pounds, every time you stand up, your legs have to pick up those extra 100 pounds. And they're used to doing it, and they do it all the time. But it's extra work, which means the heart has to work harder, the lung has to work harder, because it's doing extra work. And on top of that, when we're very heavy, sometimes it's hard to be active. And not only do you have extra work, then the muscles start to get weak. So all of these fall under the category of deconditioning. So with that, when the heart and the lungs have to do extra work, it can be sensed as shortness of breath, even if the heart and lungs are working just fine. Okay. Finally, we have to think about other things that are, aren't the muscle, aren't the heart, aren't the lungs. When we're scared, when we're anxious, our heart beats faster, we breathe faster. All of these things are natural responses to fear, anxiety, pain, depression. And all of those things can be sensed as trouble breathing, shortness of breath. So as you can see, when someone comes in and says, I just can't breathe, it's a very challenging thing to think about. And the thing that's going to really help us are your descriptions of your symptoms and then some tests. All that being said, those are the really common things. And I'm here to talk to you about a very uncommon cause of shortness of breath that is also important to think about. And it's called pulmonary hypertension. All right, so let's go back to our circulation. I just told you the heart lived in the middle of the chest and it had a left heart and a right heart and they were stuck together. For the, for the ease of understanding, I've split them up. But you guys understand they're one organ. Over, on, over here in the red, this is the left heart. And as you can see, blood's coming in. 
It's red with lots of oxygen going out to the body. That's that red arrow at the top. Okay? It goes around and feeds the body, and it comes back to the other side, the right heart, drawn in blue. Okay? It's got less oxygen. It gets pumped to the lungs in the middle, reloads that oxygen, goes back to the left heart, out to the body, back to the right heart. Okay? You guys follow this? Under it's a little different than what we were looking at, but it's the exact same thing. Okay? So that's the basics of the circulation, looking at it a little different. You have to remember, inside those lungs are blood vessels, and the blood always stays in blood vessels. So the heart sends the blood from the right heart through the lung, through the blood vessels, and it reloads on oxygen in the lung. Okay? What's pulmonary hypertension then? Here's our diagram again. To understand pulmonary hypertension, we have to understand normal. And before I explain it, I'm going to talk to you about balloons. We've all been to birthday parties, right? Two kinds of balloons at a birthday party. They're the big floppy balloons that are easy to blow up. Those are the fun ones. And then there are those really skinny balloons that you make the balloon animals out of. When you try to blow them up, you feel like your eyes are going to just pop out of your head, right? We all know the two kinds of balloons. Everyone with me? The two kinds of balloons? All right. Well, the blood vessels in the lungs should be like this balloon. Big, floppy, easy to blow up, all right? That means when the right heart says, blood, go to the lungs and reload, it's really easy to do. The right heart has to push just a little bit. The blood fills the lung blood vessels, and it's easy, not much work, all right? So that's because the pressure in those blood vessels is low, makes it floppy, makes it easy work for the right side of the heart. What's pulmonary hypertension then? Pulmonary hypertension is literally high blood pressure of the blood vessels in the lung, okay? How do you understand that? It, numbers aren't important. It's when the blood vessels in the lung become like that skinny balloon. Instead of being the floppy balloon, it becomes really hard to fill up. When that right heart says, blood, go into the lung, it has to work really hard to push it into the lung, okay? So pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure of the blood vessels in the lungs, makes it really hard for the right side of the heart to get the blood around the circulation. Remember we said anything that disturbs the circulation can cause shortness of breath. This is uncommon, but it's a very important cause of shortness of breath. Okay? Why does it matter? Well, you get high blood pressure in the arteries of the lungs. That leads to increased work for the right side of the heart to pump the blood through. Okay? That means less blood goes through, less oxygen gets into that blood when it goes through the lungs. Remember, oxygen is important so you don't feel short of breath. Oxygen levels in the blood fall because the blood didn't reload properly on oxygen. And that's what we see out here when we check your oxygen saturation. And then you get symptoms. Okay, because the heart's working harder than it should, makes you short of breath. And on top of that, the oxygen falls. That also makes you short of breath. What else is happening? Well, the heart's kind of lazy. It doesn't want to work real hard, and if you make it work too hard too long, it can start to strain. It's a muscle. It can start to fatigue. Okay? And if the right heart strains too long, it can actually start to fail, where it's really just not pumping very well. And as the right heart strains and fails, you get more symptoms. Okay? So all the things we talked about can cause shortness of breath. This one's pretty uncommon, but it's very important. Okay? Does everyone understand so far? All right, let's keep chugging along. So what causes this pulmonary hypertension? Okay? Lots of things. The first thing, though, is pretty easy to understand. It's hardening of the arteries. It's that high blood pressure in the arteries, okay, where the arteries literally change from being like the floppy balloon to being like the skinny balloon. Okay? So the arteries in the lung are diseased. That's what we called, or used to call, primary pulmonary hypertension. The correct term is now pulmonary arterial hypertension, but a lot of people still cause it, call it po uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. And what that means is the problem is the blood vessels, okay? It could also be caused by secondary causes, meaning the problem's not really the blood vessels, the problem is everything else. If you have left heart disease, 
it can back up the system, and eventually that right heart's going to feel it. But the problem is the left heart disease, not the blood vessels. It's a backup in the system. Does that make sense? If you have lung disease, the problem is the lung. The blood vessels are OK, but the lungs are not doing a good job of getting air in and out. That can be felt by the right heart as high pressure. But it's not a problem with the blood vessels. It's the lung. You fix the lung. Okay? Sometimes people can form blood clots, and they travel up to the, the heart and block the blood vessels in the lung. The blood vessels are OK, but they're blocked by blood clots. The problem's not the blood vessels. The problem is the blood clot. So it's important to figure out, is the problem primary pulmonary hypertension, PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the blood vessels are sick? Or is it something else that looks like it, Okay, the secondary causes? Why is it important to figure that out? First, the secondary causes are much more common. Okay, But treatment's really determined by whether or not you've got the primary form or the secondary form. In the primary form, where the blood vessels are the problem, you got to treat the blood vessels, because that's where the problem is. If the problem's not the blood vessels, you have to treat the problem. If it's lung disease, treat the lung disease. If it's heart disease, treat the heart disease. If it's a blood clot, start blood thinners and dissolve that blood clot. You have to treat the cause. So it's really important that when you come in with your shortness of breath, which I hope none of you have, but if you have shortness of breath, that we keep all those other diseases in mind but also remember, this could be pulmonary hypertension as well. Pulmonary hypertension, disease of the blood vessels or something else that makes it look like it's a disease of the blood vessels, and it's an important thing to figure out. We talked about that already. OK, so let's talk about this disease of the blood vessels. We're going to hone right in on the disease that you can treat, because it's a disease of the blood vessels, OK, where those blood vessels have become like those stiff balloons instead of being like the floppy balloons, OK? It's actually pretty uncommon. One to two people in 100,000. It's maybe a little more common than that, but it's very rare, OK? That's, that's less than 0.01%. It's 0.0001%, OK? It's really rare. It's often women, OK? About 60% happens in women. The average age is maybe about 50. We give you an average, but in, in reality, it's kind of two humps. An average is out to 50. A lot of people present in their 30s and their 40s with this pulmonary hypertension. And then there's a second crop of people, fewer, who present in their 60s, their 50s or 60s. When you average it together, it's in the 50s. But often, it's people in their 30s or 40s up to the age of 50. So it's a, a relatively young population that has the kind of pulmonary hypertension that involves the blood vessels. Don't forget, there's all that secondary pulmonary hypertension, and that can happen in anybody. Okay? But the kind that involves the blood vessels is often a relatively young population. Okay? The prognosis used to be really bad. Before 1995, there really were no therapies that treated this hardening of the arteries in the, in the, in the lung, this high blood, pressure of the blood pressure, high blood pressure of the vessels in the arteries. And a lot of patients who had this very rare disease died within three years. Okay? Times have changed in a good way. Since 1995, we've gone from zero therapies to nine and counting. And every time we look, patients are living longer and longer and longer. So we've gone from a place 15, 20 years ago when people were dying within three years to the fact that 80 to 90% are still alive and doing well at two years and it's moving further and further and further out. So it's an important thing to think about. It's an important thing to diagnose, because it changes people's life expectancy. It changes the quality of their life. Okay? So it used to be a really scary disease. It's still a really scary disease. But at least at this point, we have treatments. And that's just since 1995. Here's the trouble, is that the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension are shortness of breath. They're very nonspecific. We talked about 50 things that can make you short of breath. Because the symptoms are so nonspecific, it often takes one to two years 
since the onset of symptoms before someone is diagnosed. Okay? So, we have a lot of different things that can cause this pulmonary arterial hypertension. And they're not necessarily causes as so much as things that are associated with it. Sometimes it runs in families. Okay? We call that heritable or familial. Sometimes it just happens and we don't know why. Sometimes it's because you've taken a medication like fenfen or cocaine or amphetamine, and this can lead to hardening of the arteries. Sometimes it's because you have another disease like scleroderma or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. These things don't always lead to hardening of the arteries, but sometimes it does lead to hardening of the arteries, development of pulmonary arterial hypertension. At the end of the day, they all look the same. The blood vessels in the lungs have become like that skinny balloon, and the right side of the heart's having a hard time doing its job. Okay? So signs and symptoms. Why does it take us so long to figure it out? Well, they're very nonspecific. And that's the delay we just talked about. Shortness of breath. You guys can recite it now, right? A hundred things cause shortness of breath. Very nonspecific. It's primarily exertional shortness of breath. Only when it's very advanced do you get short of breath sitting still. Okay? Fatigue and weakness. Okay? The body is not getting what it needs. The heart's working really hard. It's exhausting. Patients are often tired, but that's nonspecific. A lot of things can make you tired. Edema, that's swelling. Swelling in the ankles. Um, the JVP, you don't have to worry about. That's that neck vein. A lot of your doctors will stare at your neck for a while. That's a JVP. But mainly what you'll notice is that your ankles might swell. What else makes your ankle swell? Sleep apnea makes your ankle swell. Heart failure makes your ankle swell. It's nonspecific. Okay? Hypoxemia. What does that mean? That's low oxygen. That means when we put that SAT monitor on you, it's not normal. It's not 95, 98, 100. It's low. Sometimes you only see it. It's normal when you're sitting still. We make you walk around the hallway, up and down the hallways, and then it falls. So low oxygen. But a lot of things can cause low oxygen. Heart disease, lung disease. It's nonspecific. Okay? Palpitations. Feel like your heart's racing. We just talked about AFib. That causes palpitations. If you run, your heart's going to race. It's nonspecific. Okay? And then when people are really sick, they have shortness of breath at rest. Sometimes they get chest pain when they walk around. Sometimes they feel lightheaded. But that's only when it's really advanced. All of these symptoms of pulmonary hypertension can be seen in everything else that causes shortness of breath. If you see them together, you should think about pulmonary hypertension and look for it because we can miss it. Okay? What does the evaluation look like? Well, the history. We're going to ask you an awful lot of questions. And, you know, sometimes you get tired because you've told 15 doctors the same thing. But it's an important thing because it's going to point us in the direction, is it the heart? Is it the lung? Is it just deconditioning? Or should we think about something else? Okay, and these are some of the questions that you've, asked, that you've probably been asked before if you've ever been short of breath. How long have you been short of breath? When are you short of breath? Are you coughing? Are you wheezing? Do you have fever? Have you been around someone sick? Have you been sick? Do you have a long smoking history? Should we think about lung disease because of smoking? Or do you have symptoms that point towards the heart? Ankle swelling. Do you wake up during the night because you're short of breath? Have you had high blood pressure for a long time? Have you had a history of a heart attack? That's what an MI is, myocardial infarction, a heart attack. So all these questions are going to help us figure out, is it the heart? Is it the lungs? Is it the muscle? Or should we think about pulmonary hypertension? Okay, so the history is a key part of it. Then it's a process of ruling things out. Right? We talked about all those things. We've got to think about it. The history will drive you in a direction. And then you've got to check things off your list. All right? Look at the lungs. Okay, is it COPD? Is there scarring of the lungs? Is it asthma? Some of the tests your doctor might do are lung function tests, where you sit in a room and we measure how well you breathe in, we measure how well you breathe out, and we look for abnormalities in the function of the lung. Those are called PFTs, pulmonary function tests. Okay, and they're easy to do and they're common. One of the things that's not on here that should be the first thing on my list is a chest x-ray. 
just a simple chest x-ray could tell us, it, are the lungs scarred? Is there a big, big pneumonia? Is this really easy? Something we can fix with just antibiotics, OK? If you need more detail, we can do a CAT scan, which is like a souped up chest x-ray. OK, a chest x-ray is a picture like this and a picture like this. It's two pictures. And everything is kind of smooshed up on each other. A, a CAT scan takes a million, well, not a million, but 300 pictures often. And it slices you like a Christmas ham. So we get to see your lung in a lot of detail. And it, sometimes it's really easy to see if the lungs are diseased. So we think about the lungs, and we evaluate the lungs. We examine you. We take your history. We may do a chest x-ray, think about lung function tests. And if we're really concerned about the lungs, maybe do a CAT scan. Okay? But if you don't have any lung symptoms, you don't need all of that. Okay? What about pulmonary emboli? We didn't talk about this very much, but remember I talked about sometimes people develop blood clots, and it travels up to the lung and blocks up the circulation. If you've had surgery, if one leg is swollen, there are a lot of things that make us think about it. But if we think about it, we'll work it up. And the tests you don't need to really know, one of them is a kind of a CAT scan, but with contrast, they give you some dye in the IV. Another one is a kind of a chest x-ray, but they're looking specifically for blood clots. But only if your history tells us we need to think about blood clots. Okay? And finally, is it the left heart? It's often the left heart. Okay? So more common than developing problems with the blood vessels in the lung, more commonly than developing problems with the right side of the heart. We all age. We get bad blood vessels to the left side. We have a heart attack. We have a heart that doesn't squeeze well. We have valves that have aged. It's often the left heart's the problem. But how do we know? History points you in the right direction. An EKG, where they put the leads on your chest and see what the rhythm of the heart is, that's often helpful. Sometimes a stress test puts you on a treadmill or give you a medication to make the heart work. See what the heart does when you stress it out. Does it work just fine? Or does it show you that it's not getting enough blood? And sometimes they'll do a catheterization, a left heart catheterization, where they go in the arteries and look at the blood vessels that feed the heart and make sure they're not clogged. Okay? But your history and your exam is going to point us down which road we need to go and also how far down that road we need to go. If we do all that and we really haven't found an answer, we think there might be pulmonary hypertension, get an echocardiogram. What is an echocardiogram? Are you guys familiar with an echocardiogram? For anyone who isn't, it's essentially an ultrasound of the heart. It is an ultrasound of the heart. And it doesn't hurt. It's the same machine we use to look at babies and pregnant women. It's just sound. And it's reflected back. And we can see a picture of what's going on inside. Same thing. Doesn't hurt a baby. Doesn't hurt you. We put it over where the heart is and look at the valves. And it's not a perfect look at the heart, but it's a pretty good look. And often it can tell us. Should we worry about pulmonary hypertension, or is pulmonary hypertension nowhere in sight? It gives a, us a good look at the right side of the heart. And remember we talked about when there's high blood pressure in the lung vessels, the right heart gets stressed out. So when you look with an echocardiogram, you can see, is the right heart stressed out? Okay. So the echocardiogram can say, you know, let's put this to bed. It's not pulmonary hypertension. Let's go back to all the other things that can make you short of breath or hmm, this could be let pulmonary hypertension. Let's look further. Okay. So for all of these common pathways, if you think about pulmonary hypertension, the echocardiogram is the key test that's going to help us figure out, should we be thinking about it or should we not be thinking about it? So remember way back at the beginning, I told you about this 48-year-old woman who had been healthy and she was running and now she was short of breath. Why don't we revisit her? Well, when she was seen in the office, her heart rate was a little bit on the fast side, but not too bad, nothing that you would raise an eyebrow about. Her blood pressure was a little on the low side, but perfectly reasonable for an active woman. Her oxygen saturation, when we checked on the finger, you guys have had your SATs checked, was low. It was 92. That's not normal. It's not dangerous. It's more than enough oxygen, but it's not normal. It should make us pause. Why should a healthy 48-year-old woman have low oxygen. Again, it's not dangerous, but it's not normal. Something's going on. Her heart exam was pretty normal. There's a, an abnormality that sometimes your doctor can hear, sometimes they can't. But often the heart exam is pretty normal when you're just listening with your stethoscope. The lungs, 
pretty normal. The lungs are fine. They're pulling in air. There's no scarring. So the lung exam's normal. She has a little swelling in her legs, but otherwise it looks okay. Why would a 48-year-old woman have swelling in her legs? Something's going on. It's a very subtle exam. It's easy to miss. It's low oxygen, but it's not dangerous, and it's just a little bit of swelling in the ankle. Pulmonary hypertension can be this hard to pick up, okay? But she had a good doctor. So he did a chest x-ray, looked for pneumonia, scarring of the lung, and the chest x-ray was normal. He put her on a stress test. He said, well, she's 48, but some people that get heart disease on the left side when they're young. He put her on a stress test, and the stress test was pretty normal, okay? He did lung function tests. I told you about the breathing tests. And they were just a little abnormal, but they were pretty close to normal. Very subtle abnormalities. He didn't find the answer. He did an echocardiogram. And the left side of the heart looked good, and the right side of the heart looked stressed out. This woman has pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So now that you think she has pulmonary hypertension, you guys are the experts. You should now be asking, well, is it pulmonary hypertension with the blood vessels or is it a masquerader? Remember we talked about all the secondary versus the primary because that's the next big question because that decides do you treat something else or do you need to start treating those blood vessels for pulmonary hypertension? At that point, she needs to go see a specialist. Pulmonary hypertension is pretty uncommon and not a lot of doctors treat it. The medications are pretty complicated, and the first question, is it the kind that needs to be treated, or is it the kind that you treat the other disease, is a hard question to answer. And you have to do it a lot to be able to answer it well. Why is it so important that we make sure you get to the right hands is, first, you've got to make that distinction. Is it the blood vessels, or is it something else? Because if it's not the blood vessels, you'll treat the wrong thing, OK? Second. Some patients who have diseases of the blood vessels get sick quickly, meaning this woman. Two years ago, she was running two miles. A year ago, she was doing a mile. Now she can barely get up a flight of stairs. That's a big change in two years. You want her to get treatment sooner rather than later. You don't want to wait another year. Okay? So the sooner we think about it, the sooner we diagnose it, diagnose it the better for the patient, the sooner they get better. Okay? And the more likely they are to get better. Okay? If therapy is delayed, meaning we know she has treat this disease and she doesn't get treated for a year, she's never going to do as well as she would have done if she was treated a year earlier. You never catch up. So it's important to think about it. Okay? Work it up. And the key test is the echocardiogram. It tells you if you need to go down that road or if you can just look for the other things. Okay? And the treatments are complicated. So I told you, 15 years ago, is it more than 15? It's 16 years ago now. We had no treatments for pulmonary hypertension. Now we have nine. That's a lot of new drugs. And they are different than any other kind of medication that we treat patients with. And their side effects are different. Some drugs work well for some patients. Some drugs make the patient sicker, depending on what they have. If you treat patients who don't have the right kind of pulmonary hypertension with these medications, you can make them feel worse. So just because the echocardiogram said pulmonary hypertension, you have to ask that question. Blood vessels, not blood vessels, because you have to treat the right one. And if you treat the wrong one, your patient can get sicker rather than getting better. Okay? So this is why once we start thinking about treatment, once we start thinking about pulmonary hypertension, it's really important to get, get you sent to a specialist. Okay? But all that other stuff is what your doctor's thinking about when you tell them you're short of breath. That's why you get the chest x-ray. That's why you get the, chest, the EKG. And that's why you might get the ultrasound. Okay? All those things screen you to figure out whether or not we need to think about this disease. The other thing is to confirm it. I talked about the echocardiogram as a screening test. It means it says maybe there's pulmonary hypertension here. To confirm it, you have to have a procedure, a catheterization. Now, you don't want to have a catheterization if you don't need to, OK? In the hands of an expert, the echocardiogram can sometimes say, we're barking up the wrong road. No need to do the catheterization. Or it'll say, ah, look, we were missing valve disease. This is not pulmonary hypertension. This is one of those others, and we need to treat the valve, OK? So if there's a question of pulmonary hypertension, it's important to take a close look 
To confirm it, you need to have a catheterization of the right side of the circulation. Okay? So CG, she had her catheterization because her echo gave us enough worry, and her history did as well, and it confirmed that she had pulmonary hypertension. Not just pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension. She had the disease of the blood vessels. She went on therapy, and she could only walk 300 feet, and after three months, it had almost doubled. Not quite good enough. 500 feet's good, but that's not great for 48. Increased therapy, and now she's back to walking two miles. Is she cured? Absolutely not. This is not a curable disease. It is a treatable disease. Is it still serious? Absolutely. Does it still get worse? It does. Therapy changes how quickly it gets worse. Therapy can give you back your life. If you have pulmonary hypertension, it's treatable. It's not curable, but it is treatable. Okay. So in summary, dyspnea, it's shortness of breath, and it can be caused by heart disease, lung disease, the muscles, anxiety, the emotions, or all of the above. Pulmonary hypertension, or high blood pressure of the blood vessels in the lung, is actually pretty uncommon. It's important to rule it out and think about other causes of shortness of breath. The most important screening test when you're thinking about pulmonary hypertension, and especially in a patient if you, who doesn't have any other reason to be short of breath, is the echocardiogram. That'll tell you continue down this road or not. Think about something else. And then treatment really depends on what kind of pulmonary hypertension you have. Is it the disease of the blood vessels? Or is it one of those others that just looks like a disease of the blood vessels? Okay? Very rarely you can have one of those others and a disease of the blood vessels. That's pretty uncommon, um, but we look for that as well.